always appreciative of all the people that are joining us online. Um, well, everybody figured this would happen sooner or later, that I was going to push the five minutes into ten minutes, and then I was eventually going to just push it right into a full service, and so that's this morning. <laughs> so we're glad you're here, and I'm hopefully going to have an awesome morning to where you guys have an awesome morning, because God's already having an awesome morning. So this morning, I would like to talk to you about the best evangelist I ever met. The best evangelist I ever met was a canary. Now, let's just start off right with this. I'm going to need laughs. I'm going to wait for laughs. And so we can either get out at 1130 or we can get out at 12 or we can get out at 1. So laughs speed things along here. So we'll go for laughs. The best evangelist I ever met was a canary. And I will get to that evangelist, but I want to talk about something else real quick first. Two months ago, Pastor Mike said, hey, I'm going to be gone these days. Can you cover for me? I says, of course I can. What a treat. I just, I just felt like, what a treat. I mean, you guys are an amazing family. I'm incredibly humbled and incredibly honored to be in front of you this morning, and it's just neat. It's really a neat treat. So I was excited, and so the next thing that you obviously do when you're asked to speak is you go ask God, hey, God, what would you like me to talk about this morning? And here's... Here's the conversation. Here's how it went. God, what would you like to t for me to talk about this Sunday morning? Be calm, be happy. My reply was, I'm not really nervous, so I am calm, and I am happy about getting the chance to do this, so this is all going to be good, but what do you want me to talk about? Be calm, be happy. Now my tenor changes a little bit because now I am neither calm nor happy. <laughs> it's like, God, have you been listening to Mike's messages? Be calm, be happy is not in that thing. We need something with a little more juice to it. God's answer, silence. So we knew that we were going to have to move forward with be calm and be happy. In John, Jesus says to us, John 14, 27, Wow, you are faster than I am. See, I'm going to get replaced. I'm going to get replaced back there at the thing. Uh, John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to you do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And then in 1 Peter 1, 8, at the end of it, it says that you rejoice. We rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible and full of glory. Joy and peace are really simple concepts. Everybody understands them. And in this room, amazingly enough, it is easy to operate in that. But honestly, the second you walk out that door, it seems like there is something that is trying to take that joy, trying to take that peace. And so to make sure that I'm in the right room and talking to the right group of people, who in here over the last 365 days has at one time had your joy or peace try to be taken from you? Okay, okay. So I'm in the right room because I was concerned. Maybe, maybe I'm the only one that's getting my joy and peace stolen or trying to take it away from me. And so I said, I better check real quick. So I asked God, where are we going to go with this? What are we going to do? And here's how it starts out. In Matthew... 1320, it says this. Wow. She is a lot faster than I am. I'm kind of embarrassed now. I'm fumbling around and she's, just, she's got Matthew 13, 26. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. I'm just telling you, there have been times in this room where I heard things. And because of what I heard, it straightened out so much in my heart. Instantly, joy came into my heart. It's like, this is cool. This is why you come to church. You come to church to leave happier than when you left. You don't want to go to a church. Little FYI, if you go to a church and you were sort of happy and you leave and you're less happy, 
you're probably not in a real good church. You want to go to a church that when you leave, it's like, I'm glad I went to church this morning. Not, I wonder if the line's big at Denny's. And so you want to go to a church where you, but there's a problem there. I believe this. I believe there is not one person who doesn't want to have joy in their life. I believe that there's not one person that when they hear something that creates joy, that they don't instantly just pull it into their heart. I've never met anybody that honestly can just reject joy just like, no. But there's a problem, and the scripture says it. It says immediately something comes along and tries to steal that. And it gives a whole litany of things of what tries to steal our joy, what tries to steal our peace. But this morning what we're going to talk about is a really cool anti-theft protection plan. The last, last uh, was it last week or two weeks ago, Christine's wallet came up missing. And how we found out it came up missing was all of a sudden we got a charge on our credit card that we didn't recognize. It's like, hmm. So I call the wonderful folks at the credit card place, and they say, don't worry. You've got an anti-theft protection program going on, and so we didn't have any problems there. And this morning what we're going to talk about is a spiritual anti-theft protection program that keeps your peace, keeps your joy with you, and doesn't let the enemy get it, whatever the enemy might be. So we're going to start a thing where it is three words, two conversations. Three words, two conversations. And I want to set the scene, and we're going to move to Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. It says, On that same day when evening had come, he said to them, Jesus talking here, you know, we should really get that. I just, that just came to me. It's the first time I noticed that. We should really have like the red letter overhead edition to where it's like, there it is up there. So on the same day, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. They're at a lake. They're going to cross over the other side. Now, spoiler alert, in case you haven't read this passage. I'm sure most have. But in case you haven't read this, when Jesus says we're going to cross over to the other side, that does not mean that he's got this sinister plan where he's going to get you halfway across the lake and then say, oh, guess what? I'm leaving you guys. I'm walking the rest of the way. No, when Jesus says we're going to the other side of the lake, we're going to the other side of the lake. It is safe. We are going to the other side of the lake. Um, so we don't know how long it took. Okay, now I, I've oscillated on whether I was going to do this or not, and now I'm going to do it. I don't know what the average age mean is but I, in here, but I hope that most... Who in here had ever watched Gilligan's Island? <laughs> Whew! This is going to work out Okay. <laughs> Because I wrote this down. I literally wrote this down, and then I snickered to myself, and I said, well, it says, I, I wrote down that we don't know how long into this three-hour tour the weather started getting rough, and the tiny ship was tossed. And I just wrote it down because I was writing down what I was thinking, and then I said, wait a second, I think I just plagiarized something. I better get that straightened out. But somewhere in the trip, things went drastically wrong. And in the middle of all this, it says that the boat was taking on water. And in the middle of all this, it says Jesus was asleep. And when it talks about the type of sleep that he was in, it is literally sleep like you're not alive anymore. A deep, deep sleep. And so I thought to myself, I says, I wonder in here, has anybody ever went through a storm of life and it felt like Jesus was asleep while you were going through the storm of life. Has anybody ever had that feeling where it's like, I know he's with me, but it kind of seems like he's asleep right now. And so I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty real. So in their fear, and it's important to mention, it was in their fear, they wake Jesus up. They are freaked out now. And... Uh, at this moment, Jesus has two conversations using three words, two English words in the Greek, and gives the most amazing sermon on peace that was ever given. 
simply saying, peace, be still. Now, I know that right now everybody in this room is thinking, how can Jesus say that in three words? And Nathan's going to take another 30 minutes here to finish up. (laughs) He's Jesus, I'm not. And so, at this point, when I steer to this scripture, I'm excited because I see the word peace. And it's like, yes, that's what we're talking about, peace. It's all going to work out okay. I'm going to have an okay message. I'm not going to have to run for the door at the end of the message. It's going to be awesome. And I look up the words like any good father's house graduate would to know what does the word exactly mean. We're not just taking, just because it says peace, we don't assume that that's the entirety of it. So peace means simply this being asked to remain silent or choosing to remain silent. Little discouraging. That's not the piece that I was looking for. But I says, wait, we still got be still, so it's going to be okay. And be still is this. I brought a piece of tape up. For those of you that are listening and not watching, you will see right now, you would see me ripping off a piece of tape about the size of one's mouth and placing it over my mouth. (laughs) Be still means to be muzzled, to be totally science, or the the uh, the non-arguable version of, hey, could you be quiet for a second? I'm sure that Christine in my life has had times where it's like, where's the tape at with that guy? We need to get the tape, we need to get that guy silenced So, now I'm fully discouraged, because we're talking about peace this morning, right? We're talking about the goodness of having peace in your life, and what all that produces, and the joy that it produces in your life, and now I've been told to be quiet twice. And so, I ask God, why did Jesus say, be quiet twice? And what does having peace? being quiet have to do with having peace. Two conversations. Two conversations is a concept that everybody understands, but not everybody thinks about that they understand. But I'm going to put it in real simple terms. How many in here are a mom or a dad? Internet, I'm expecting you to raise your hand, even though we can't see you. We're believing that you're going to raise your hand. So moms or dads, raise your hands. Okay. Now to cover the rest of everybody. Who in here has ever been a kid that has rode with your mom and dad on a road trip? Okay. You're going to understand this. This is going to make sense to you. Spring break. I did not plan this, that this was this way. I was already writing this down long before spring break. I knew that it was spring break. But it's spring break. It's family vacation time. And you have just worked the hardest week of your life to take one week off. I have figured out that here's how taking time off works. You work half of the time that you're going to take off before you leave, and then you extra, and then you work the other half of the time when you get back. So it's really not time off, it's just time deferred on either side of the time that you're not going to be at work. So, yes, time between. And so you, mom and dad have just worked this incredibly hard week but we're finally in the car. And we're five hours into a destination that's nine hours away. And we're kind of happy. We're finally settling into it. I don't know if anybody's the same as me, but a lot of times when I go on vacation, Christine says, it takes three days for you to unwind enough to actually be on vacation. And then you actually start your vacation three days into the vacation. So we're five hours into a nine-hour road trip. And in the back seat, we have two lovely children. I'm going to name one of those children Nitro Jenny. Nitro Jenny is a sharp young little lady that is just happy to be on a vacation with mom and dad. And on the other seat is a young man, and I'm going to name him Glycerlin. And Glycerlin is a precocious young man who has brought all his equipment of life into his seat. And somewhere at this five-hour mark, 
Glycer Lens toys migrate over to Nitrogeny's side. And then it ensues. The two and a half hour argument over the sovereign territory of the back seat. I don't know if anybody's been in this car, but I've definitely been in this car when this was happening. And at the moment that mom and dad's heads are about ready to pop right off their shoulders and they're ready to turn the whole car around for real, not for just, they do this. Now, if you haven't had to do this, it's really important that you understand how this works. If you do not look in the rear view mirror, it counts for nothing. If you just say it, it doesn't count for anything. So you have to look in the rear view mirror and you have to get eye contact. So whichever is the calmest of the parents looks in the mirror, catches eye contact with them, and here's what they say. Direct it towards Nitrogeny. They say, be quiet. And direct it to Glycerin. It's be still. Now they didn't, all they said was, be quiet and be still. But everybody knew what was going on, right? Everybody understood who was being talked to, what they were supposed to do, and how they were supposed to do it. So everybody understands the concept of one storm, one conversation that is to two different people. And so, let's look at the conversation that Jesus had. Peace, be still. I want to look at the second half of the conversation first. Jesus tells the storm, be still. Now, Jesus tells the storm basically this. I'm muzzling you. You no longer have a right to exist. You don't have a right to, to, to be a storm anymore. I'm muzzling you. And he's not going to negotiate with the storm. He's not going to be like the other day I was in Walmart and a little five-year-old, honestly, if I would have been thinking at all, I would have turned my phone on and captured the whole thing. Because I see the little kid and I know what's about ready to happen because he's looking at all the candy bars. <laughs> but the fatal thing happened that the mom wasn't quick enough to catch was he got one in his hand. And once he got one in his hand, then he went to the floor and... Guess who left the store with the candy bar? That's right, the young man did. So Jesus wasn't going to deal with the storm like this. This wasn't a negotiation that he was going to have with, this, with the storm like, hey, I'm asking you to be quiet. No, he muzzled the storm. He said, that's it. You're quiet, it's over. Now the first part of the conversation was to the disciples. And it's important to bear in mind where the disciples were at in their heart. Because what happens is, just if you don't really see where they're at, you don't really see where Jesus is at. And so the disciples come to Jesus, and here's what they do. They're terrified. What they see is a horrible event unfolding in front of them. Um, they see their destiny ending, or at a minimum, they see their destiny being separate from Jesus. They're with Jesus right now, but they see a destiny that is separate from Jesus. They know Jesus is going to make it. They're just not sure they're going to make it. So they see a thing. So they wake Jesus up, and they tell him, I believe this circumstance, I believe this situation has become impossible. I think it's over. And in fact, Mark 4.38, we catch up with, look at that, says, but he was asleep at the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? This really tells it all. I love this because so much is said right here. They wake Jesus up from a place of physical peace. He's at peace. He's sleeping. He's sleeping calmly. They wake him up from a place of peace so that he can tell them that they have left their place of spiritual peace. Here, here he is, and he's, he's okay. He's knowing he's going to the other side. And he wakes up from his peace to tell them, guys, you have left your peace. You have, 
you've allowed yourself to uh, totally get freaked out here. Okay, now, were they safe? Yeah, they were with Jesus. They were safe. They were going to, so it was only their thoughts that had left. They were still safe. They were going to make it to the other side. Jesus didn't have an ulterior motive like, you know, these 12 disciples are really dragging me down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get halfway out in the lake. I'm going to walk the rest away. Who knows what happens to them? And I'm going to get a whole new set of disciples on their side and start fresh. No, he was good with these guys. He'd already, done, he'd already invested a lot of training in them. He wanted to take it on through with them. So he, they weren't in any risk except for in their thoughts. They had left the peace of the Father. That was gone. Um, now, Jesus, on the other hand, he is not operating in fear here. Um, he knows what the Father told him. The Father told him, you're going to the other side. It's okay, you're going to the other side. He knew that. It's easy to picture Jesus. I mean, just picture yourself, honestly. Okay, everybody, we're just going to take a moment. A little mind exercise here. We're going to picture ourselves on, the, on a nice, comfy pillow on a boat that somehow is sheltering you so that you're not getting splashed with water, and you don't sense that water has creeped up into the boat. And you wake up, you're being, you've been woken up by people. Okay, I'm gonna, I didn't think I was going to go there, but I am going to go there. My brother <laughs> has a home that has a very high water table. And the water, one Sunday morning, rose in the basement. And the pump that was supposed to go pump, 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 and pump it out evidently was disconnected so something toy-wise could be plugged in and played with. So my brother doesn't know this. He goes to church. He's happy at church. He comes home, and he comes home, and the daughter says, oh, by the way, Dad, there's about four inches of water in the basement. You can kind of imagine what plays out next. It's not an ideal thing. Well, this is how we kind of envision Jesus, isn't it? We envision him waking up like, you guys were in charge. I left you guys in charge. I wake up, the boat's half filled with water, and everything else. And you imagine a Jesus that is very intense, very freaked out, very scared, but he wasn't freaked out, scared, or afraid. In fact, with a calm authority, knowing that he was the Son of God, he looks at the disciples and says, guys, I'm going to ask you to be quiet for just a second. Why I reestablish, why I reestablish God's order in this situation. That's what he was doing. So why two conversations? I thought about this a lot. Why not just say to the, to the waves, calm down? If you tell the waves to calm down, everything's good, right? Everything's no problems. The disciples see, waves are calmed down, and there's no problem. The problem was the disciples were having two conversations of their own in their own heads. There was a lot of conversations going on in the boat, to be for sure. Uh, the first conversation was this. I don't know how many of them were fishermen. It doesn't say who was in the boat. But I do know this. They were all raised around water. They all understood what water meant, and they all understood that they were in a really bad place. Now, you suspected that somewhere in here I was going to sneak a family story in, and now I am. And so this is insert family story here. My dad loves adventures. He just, he lives for adventures. So I've already told you a little bit about the raft that we had that had 125 patches on it. But one summer, here's what my dad decides. He says, we're going to go on an epic rafting trip. Now, in Colorado, there are possibly some of the most beautiful scenic rafting rivers in the world. They're beautiful. They're tranquil. They push you along at just the right speed to where you can just, you don't have to paddle much. You can look, you can fish, you can do whatever you want. You can have an amazing time. It's beautiful. 
And then when you add Wyoming and Utah, we've got some incredible rafting around here. And what my dad did was he took out a map of those three states, he brought out a red pin, and everything that was calm and tranquil, he put a red X through it. We're not going there. We are not going there. We are going to go to some place that's just crazy. So he picks the headwaters of the Green River up in Wyoming. And fate always plays a funny part in this. They had a really big rain the day before we showed up. Afterwards, we find out that the water was running at its maximum level that it's ran for 100 years. It's running a lot of water. But where we get in, it's really cool because it's just ankle deep, and you just kind of get into the raft, and you push it out into the thing. And then the first little bit, it was just amazing. It was just like what you'd picture. You're being floated down the river. Things are awesome. And all of a sudden, you start hearing this noise. And then the question comes up. Niagara Falls is still in New York, right? Because it was noisy. It was noisy. So my dad, in his infinite wisdom, he says, you know, this might be a great time to portage around this spot. Now, I've done a little studying about Lewis and Clark. As I understand portage to be, you take the boat out of the water, you walk around the bad spot, and you put the boat back in. Right? No, not my dad. Here's what he does. is He says, Mom, kids get out of the boat, me and my grandfather are going to go ahead and raft this, and then we'll, you just walk down and we'll pick you up on the other side. All sounds really safe and good so far, right? And so here's what happens. They get into bad, bad waters. It is tossing the raft everywhere, and we have no rafting skills, and it's just my dad and my, his dad. So pretty quick, here's what he says. They're able to get to the side of the bank, and they say they're going to get out because it's just too much. So my dad hops out of the boat, raft, with a rope. And he's about waist deep, and he's working towards the shore. And my grandfather gets nervous, like somehow my dad's going to cut him loose, and this is it, Eskimo and the iceberg moment, and see you later, Dad. And so he gets he stands on the pontoon of the raft and jumps for the bank, which he promptly lands halfway between bank and the raft, or right in the center of the river. And instantly, he's swept away down the river. So my dad, being the G.I. Joe figure that he is, says, I will just jump from the bank into the raft and go catch him which he jumps and misses the boat by about the same distance that my grandfather missed the bank. So now my father, holding on to a rope that's attached to the raft, is going down the river chasing after my grandfather that is holding on to his life jacket like this, looking straight forward and not giving any attention to either side. My dad finally, after quite a bit of time, struggles. Have you ever tried to get in a raft when you're in the water? It's awful. So, he finally gets in the raft, and he comes up behind my grandfather, and my grandfather's name was Harry, and he says, Harry, Harry, Harry. My grandfather is refusing to turn around because he's convinced that it's an angel coming for the final pickup, <laughs> and this is it. <laughs> Finally, my dad grabs him by the thing and shakes him, and he turns around, and it's like, so. Sometimes you understand the severity of your situation. Sometimes you do not. The disciples definitely understood. They were not like my dad and my grandfather. They definitely understood where they were at. They understood that this was serious, and they understood that it was life-threatening. Uh, the disciples had started to look at where they were at, and they were letting where they were at and what they were seeing decide for them who they were. And who they saw they were were mere men 
against a circumstance that was trying to take their life. And all of us can relate to that at some level. Either you have a friend or you yourself have faced something where it's like, I feel like a mere human being facing something that's trying to take everything from me. So this is the moment they're at. Um, the second conversations the disciples were having. They'd spent a lot of time with Jesus. They'd seen a lot of things. So the one thing they understood is even though they were feeling that way, they understood Jesus' potential. And they felt like, I need to get Jesus in on this because this is going completely, uh, completely sideways. And I love seeing what the Father does at this moment. I love, I just love how God interacts with things. Jesus understood that without true peace, it didn't matter the size of the wave. It could have been the smallest wave out there and it was going to overtake their boat. If, and in our lives, have you ever been at that moment that it just seemed like the smallest thing, one more thing, one more straw, and that's going to be it. That's going to be it. But what Jesus understood was the true peace like we find in John 14, 27. Perfect. The peace that I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, here's the world's peace program. Here's the world's peace program. I'm going to fix your problem, and then you'll have peace. Right? That's how the world addresses things. I'm going to just fix your problem, and then you're going to have peace. Here's the problem with, with that. When something goes wrong in life, when a circumstance or situation, you find yourself in the middle of one of life's storms. Has anybody been in a life storm moment over the last 365 days? Or am I the only one? Oh, good. Okay, two of you. Good. So I'm talking to the two of you now. <laughs> I'm in a, now I'm in a second life storm right now. I was the only one that experienced this. Um, here's the problem. When you're in the middle of a life storm, and let's say even the problem gets fixed, there's an unfortunate byproduct that happens out of that. You become aware of the fact that that situation or that circumstance didn't love me. I remember the first time I made it to when I was 18, before the first time that I really knew someone didn't like me. And I, I remember when it happened because I went home and I just said to myself, I really can't believe they don't like me. What's the matter with them? Don't they know how fun I am? Don't they know how, how, how good it is to be around me? It just really shocked me. And I didn't really know how to deal with that. But the byproduct of a life storm is this. All of a sudden, you know that that thing didn't like me, or at a minimum, it was indifferent to me. And then fear comes in. I'm vulnerable. Anybody in here ever felt vulnerable? Life might try to judge me again. And it might try to punish me. In 1 John 4.18, it says, Wow. She is better than me. <laughs> there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Torment, translated, correction, punishment, or penalty. And involves... Now, sometimes the Bible just chooses unique ways to. When I looked up what the word involves means, it says wedding. I says, well, that was kind of weird coupled together, that you coupled together correction, punishment, and penalty with wedding. That didn't seem right to me. And so, but it's that thing where you're bound together. Where you're bound together in a closer relationship than anything you can imagine. So it, here's how it goes. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear 
because fear has joined together or has its grip on correction, punishment, or penalty. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So where are the disciples here? They're fearing because they didn't understand they were loved. Jesus just wanted them to understand right now, in the middle of this storm, the Father loves you. His perfect love is with you right now. And that wave, that storm, that is not your problem. Believing that you've been separated from that love, that's the problem. So, with the type of peace that Jesus has given us here, the cool thing is the inverse happens. Now, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter how big the wave is. It doesn't matter how big life's storm is because what we understand is we are more than conquerors in this situation, not because of anything other than who I am and where I'm seated. Uh, so Jesus says, guys, I need you to be quiet for just a second, and I'm going to show you you are in the center of the Father's love, and you are with the Father right now. It's just like we find in Exodus 14, 13. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation. I could stop right there. Yep. It's awesome. It's not saying, Nathan, you need to do something to turn, turn this peace up in your life. You need to make great decisions. You need to meditate. You need to read more. You need to... It's no. Stand still. Stand still means... Stand still and see the salvation of your Lord. That's right. It's a beautiful thing. So we know that the real enemy is not the circumstance. We know this. We know the real enemy is not the situation that we encounter. Yet when you're in the middle of a storm, when one of life's storms shows up in your life and your boat is being swamped, and it involves people or things that are real that touch you and actually you feel them. When it seems like a whole army of problems is addressing you all at once, it's hard to remember that the enemy is our, is, is our thoughts and the second conversation that's going on in our head. A thoughts that we're going to be separated, separated from the Father, separated from his love, separated from his wisdom, separated from his power. That's the real fear. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says this, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is what's happening in the boat here. Um... We see thoughts trying to take over every, over every conversation. Who in here has ever had a moment where your thoughts start telling you how it's going to be? And they're not telling you a good story. They're not telling you that things are going to work out okay. It tries to override or make itself more important than the knowledge that I have a relationship with a loving father. And I have all the resources that the loving father has. That's where I'm at right now. Um, and when we bring those thoughts to the obedience of Christ, what's he going to do? What is he going to do with those thoughts when I come to him and say, Jesus, this is what my thoughts are telling me right now. And I hand them to him. He's going to do this. Shh. Be quiet, because right now I'm going to remind you it doesn't matter what you see, hear, or feel. What I'm physically experiencing or not, because you are seated with the Father right now. He perfectly loves us. There is no question about where his love is effort. It's perfect. And all the resources that I have are because he's given them to me. 
When I grew up in church, they taught me that Jesus loved to chew people out. In fact, probably, here's what they did. Every other week, they talked about Jesus and the whip. So they talk one thing about one week, and then they go back to the whip. Another thing, the whip. They loved that whip story. They loved telling me that Jesus was mean and that he was kind of a punisher type of guy. But one of the cool things that we've learned here, if you've been at Father's house for very long at all, what you know is mean Jesus does not exist. Mean Jesus is not real. Mean Jesus is a fabrication of somebody who wants to be mean themselves. Mean Jesus doesn't exist. I'm glad that I've learned that. It is sheds an entirely different light on what is said next. And Mark 440, this is another one that they love to tell me. But Jesus said to them, and here's how they would say it. This is the voice inflection. Why are you guys so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Anybody ever heard it said that way? Yeah, because it's a chew out, isn't it? Well, see, the first thing for this to be a chew out is, first off, you have to subscribe to mean Jesus. That he's, there's a mean Jesus out there that likes chewing. The second thing you have to subscribe to is the fact that Jesus was freaked out and scared. And so that he came and chewed him out. I mean, <laughs> okay. Family story that I, wasn't, I don't have in the notes. One day we decided to move a big iron table. Big. 250, 300 pounds. I was in sixth grade, and I'm the oldest, so it just stair stepped down from there. So what, what do they call those guys that they're riggers? The guys that rigs big stuff up to be lifted? Me, in sixth grade, and my two younger brothers are the riggers. We're the ones that are going to rig this up to be moved. My dad is the tractor runner guy. And so we're supposed to steady the table and not let it move. So we hook it up, we get it in the air, and we're moving. And as chains sometimes do, they can move on you a little bit. So we had all our little kid fingers underneath the table, and... The table moves, and instantly, all of us pull our fingers out because we're smart enough to say, hey, that looks like a guillotine and no fingers at the end of the day. We pulled our fingers out super quick, and my dad hops off the tractor and goes, what are you guys doing? Why did you do that? Well, see, that was because he was afraid. He was afraid about what happened. He was afraid of the potential that he saw, but Jesus was not there. Jesus was not afraid. He knew that they were all going to the other side. There was no question about how this was going to play out. So, I see it entirely different. I see it as Jesus seeing their beauty and their potential at the same time. The beauty was they had already sacrificed their lives. They had already chose to follow him, whatever that was. They wrote him a blank check. And the potential was, guys, you could have calmed the storm yourself. The design was, this was something you could have done. And this is an incredible moment, because he saw their beauty and their potential. This was a moment of encouragement, not a moment of, hey, you guys really messed up, and sorry that you messed up. It was a moment of encouragement. Guys, you can do this. He knew what they were going to do next. He knew they could do this. Um, in the beginning, I told you that I was going to tell you about the best evangelist I ever heard, and it was a canary. Some of you might remember that, some of you might not, but I'm going to talk about that canary now. The canary is just a concept canary. It's not an actual canary. It's a concept, and let me explain. Who in here has ever had a chance to travel deep into a cave or deep into a mine? It's kind of a freaky place. It's kind of a scary place. I can't imagine being like a coal miner. 
I can't imagine being down in the deep mines in Africa where they spend 30 minutes descending into the earth to be mining. It's intense. It's intense. In the early 1900s, they used canaries in the mine. The reason they used canaries, as you probably mostly know, is the poisonous gas would affect them and it would kill them before it killed a person, so they would know, canary's dead, we need to go ahead and leave. So it was, kind of a, it was kind of a good thing. What most people don't know is they started off with mice. I didn't know this. It was really kind of fun research. They started off with mice. They switched canaries because canaries sing. So they were spending their time working, and what they would do is every so often they would stop working if they heard the singing, they kept on working. They knew that we're safe because I hear the singing. It's kind of neat. This morning we talked about a peace that only comes from knowing the Father's love. Knowing that love truly can silence all other conversations that are going on in your head. The beauty and the peace of that relationship that we have with the Father it really can't be measured. It's not something you can really put your finger on and say, this is, this is how much value that is to me. It's, what, it's indescribable. Just like the song this morning, it's indescribable. It, I can't put a description on how much that means to me. My first co- encouragement this morning to you comes this. Let there be only one conversation in your heart. No matter what's going on the outside, let only one conversation go on in your heart. You are seated with him, and he loves you perfectly. That is the only conversation that needs to go on. But I want to just go one step further. Let me tell you about a beautiful byproduct that when you're in that peace, the byproduct that it produces, it causes your life to sing. Who in here, when you're just in your peaceful, happy moment, you just, you're happy. It radiates from you. Christine will look at me and she's like, what made you so happy? It's a surprise. It's like, look, he's happy. It's great. (laughs) Everybody that's operating in peace, there's just a natural byproduct of happiness that happens. And it, it just produces it. And it causes our lives to sing. And in case anybody didn't get a chance to watch the news last night, the world's a scary place out there. It's a dark, deep cave. So when we have this relationship with the Father that's causing our lives to sing, for the people that are close to us, they're in the middle of their own life storm. When they be quiet for a second, what do they hear? They hear your life singing. They hear your peace. They see your peace. And do you know what that does for them? It takes them to a place where they understand God is still bigger than my problems. He loves me, and that can still make a difference. And hope and joy change from just concepts to a reality. They're seeing it happen right in you guys. The very best evangelists I've ever seen are you. When you take that peace out into the world. And for those people that are in the middle of life's storms. And you show up. And what you're telling them in a thousand different ways is. You are seated with the Father. His love is perfect. His love is perfect towards you. And it's going to be okay. That's where I'm going to close this morning.